Tonight is the eighth session of our Surah Al-Kahf Tafsir class. And in tonight's session, we will try to understand the Tafsir of the tenth verse of Surah Al-Kahf. Like I said before in my last session, that in verse number 9, 10, and 11 of Surah Al-Kahf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will summarize the story of the people of the cave. And then in the next page and a half, Allah will give us all the details that we need to know. So in these first three ayat, 9, 10 and 11, Allah will give the summary, will give the introduction. And then in the rest of the page and a half, Allah will give us the details of the story of the people of the Kahf. So the last, uh, in the last session, the ayah that we did, the tafsir of the ayah that we did was, Am hasibta anna ashab al kahfi wa raqim Do you think, or did you assume, that the people of the Kahf, Kahf and the story of the people of the Kahf are of the most wondrous signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What it means is that the people of Makkah, uh, the Quraysh of Makkah, they came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to challenge him. And how did they challenge Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? By asking him to tell them about the story of the people of the Kahf. And they are thinking that this story of the people of the cave is the most wonderful story. It's the most wonderful miracle of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to them, this is a very trivial miracle. As compared to so many other big miracles, this miracle was a very small thing. If you look at the character and the conduct, and you know, if you look at the book that is revealing upon Prophet Muhammad, there are much more bigger signs, there are much more bigger miracles of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than the story of the people of cave. And you are ignoring all of these big miracles and you want to quiz on him with this small thing, with this small story of the people of the cave. That's stupid, that, that's ridiculous. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, since you want to know about the story of the people of the cave, it's okay, we will tell you about the story of the people of the cave. So now the, the story of the people of the cave begins. But before we do it, before I do the tafsir of this ayah, of the ayah number 10, just want to clarify one thing that we did in the last session, but just want to make it more clear, inshallah. Who are the people of the cave? <clears throat> there is a big difference of opinion among the scholars with regards to that. Some scholars say that this is a group of people from this area, this is a group of people from that area. And at least, uh, as far as I know, every single Muslim culture in the world, they take qasam of Allah, they swear by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they say that in our culture, in our country, there is a cave of the seven sleepers. And I won't be surprised to meet a Pakistani guy who will come up to me and tell me that we have many caves in Pakistan, and one of those caves is the cave of the sleepers. But for sure we don't know who are these people because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never mentioned any details in the Quran. For sure we don't know who were these people, where were they were from. Some people, some scholars say that they were early Christians. Early Christians. And this makes sense. But the thing, uh, there is, the only problem with that opinion is that if they were early Christians, then the Jews of Medina would have never asked about them. Do you know the story behind it? The people of Mecca, they went to the Jews of Medina. And why did they go to the Jews of Medina? Because they thought that the Jews of Medina are the most educated people, knowledgeable people. So they went to them and they said, give us something so that we can quiz Prophet Muhammad, so that we can challenge him, something that he wouldn't know. And then the Jews of Medina told them to ask Prophet Muhammad about the people of the... And by the way, in those times, now Jews and Christians, they love each other, but in those times, Jews used to hate Christians. Even in their books, they accuse Aisha, they accuse Maryam alayhi salatu wasalam, na'uzu billah of adultery. So they hated Christians. <coughs> so if they were early Christians, the people of the cave, then the Jews of Medina would have never asked the people of Quraysh to ask Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasalam about the people of the cave. If they were early Christians. So what they say is that the people of the cave were the early Jews. And they used to live in an Iranian province. And in that province, the king was Zoroastrian. He was a fire worshipper. And at times, he used to persecute Muslims. He used to persecute people who used to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So maybe they were a group of early Christians. <coughs> maybe they were a group of early Jews. But whoever they were, they used to believe in Allah. They used to believe in true prophet. Their society was a pagan society. Their society was an idolatrous society. So do we understand that? Alhamdulillah. Now the story of the... People of the cave begins. The tenth, the tenth ayah. Is awal fitya to ilal kahf. Remember the time when a group of young people, fitya means young people, the prime in their youth, fityan, who are in the prime of their youth, 20, 21, 23, 25 years old. This is the age. When a group of young people, they sought refuge in a cave. Fakalu, and they said, Rabbana atina. They entered the cave. 
And the first thing they did when they entered the cave is that they made a dua. And they said, Rabbana atina milladun ka rahma. O our Rabb, grant us mercy that comes directly from you. Wahayi lana min amrina rashada and make our affairs straight and firm. What does this show us? I'm just going to do the tafsir of this one ayah, so don't worry. I'm only going to take 15 minutes. I have 10 minutes. Now I need your attention. What does this show us? They are fleeing from a problem. They're looking for a cave. They found a cave, went into the cave. The first thing that they did is that they made a dua to Allah. Here, there is a combination of two things. Whenever you are in trouble, whenever you are in a bad situation, you do two things, Islamically speaking, two things. Number one, you do something from the world. And number two, you do something from the Akhirah. Number one, Dini. Number two, Dunyavi. Something spiritual and something physical. You get sick, you go to a doctor, you make dua. You don't have a job, you send your resume everywhere, use all the contacts that you have, you make a dua. You don't have an education, you go to a college, you make a dua. These people, they are fleeing for their lives, running away from their community, looking for a cave, find a cave, goes into a cave, then make dua to Allah. They didn't say that we believe in Allah, we have tawakkul in Allah, Allah will protect us. We don't have to go anywhere, we don't need to go anywhere. You just sit in your houses, Allah will pluck you from the heavens, and Allah will protect you from the enemies. No. They did whatever they could. And then they made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What does this show us about our religion? Before I tell you anything, I want to give you a hadith of Rasulullah. Because you know, a lot of times when we become super religious, I don't want to make, I don't want to make fun of anyone. And I am as guilty as all of you. But sometimes when we become very religious, in our mind, what we are supposed to do is just tawakkul in Allah. Tawakkul ala Allah. And people actually don't understand the meaning of tawakkul ala Allah. What does it mean to have reliance upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Let me give you a funny example first. By the way, tawakkul ala Allah means there is a book called Sharah Tahzeeb. And the scholar of that book, the author of that book, he gives us the definition of tawakkul ala Allah. What does it mean to rely upon Allah? So he says, tawakkul ala Allah means tawjihu al-asbabi nahwa al al khair. You use all the means that are available and you direct them in the right position. That's what you do. That's what we call tawakkul ala Allah. That you use all the means and you direct them in the right position, in the right position and that's what you call tawakkul ala Allah. A person came to meet Rasulullah. Authentic narration by the way. A person came to meet Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Medina. Came from far off place so he came onto his camel. He went into the mosque. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked him, where is your camel? Where did you leave your camel? Did you make sure that your camel is safe? Did you tie your camel to something? You make sure? He said, no, Ya Rasulullah, I left my camel, tawakkal ala Allah. Relying upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I left my camel outside. And Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, there are some wolves outside, predator outside. They have tawakkal ala Allah, they are roaming around, they have tawakkal ala Allah. They will find their food very easily, inshallah now. What does it show us? Kaab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he, he gave us a very unique incident. <coughs> He said, we were sitting with the companions. With, uh, we companions, we were sitting with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Masjid al-Nabi. Sunan Abi Dawud riwayah. The riwayat is mentioned in Sunan Abi Dawud. He said, we were sitting with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in a mosque in the morning time. And all of a sudden, we saw a young man. And this young man is full of strength. He's strong, sharp, he's, no, he's, he's young and he's strong. And not only he has physical strength, he's active. When he wants to do something, he accomplishes it. And not only that, he gets up early in the morning to do his job, to see his business, to do his job. So we see this man. And we saw how he looked, and how strong he is, and how active he is, and how he's going to his work early in the morning. We looked at him, and we said to him, wow unto him. Wow unto him. That he's so strong. He said that whatever he was doing, we thought, the Sahaba said, we thought that whatever he was doing, he was not doing it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we said, wow to him. If he only uses his strength and energy for the sake of Allah. And in those times, Sabilillah means, sake of Allah means that you go out in the path of Allah and you fight. You fight on a battlefield, meaning you are a mujahid. That's what Sabilillah. In a normal context, that's how people used to use Sabilillah. If only he uses his strength and energy to go out in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to propagate the deen of Allah. 
Prophet said to them, La taqulu haza. Don't say this. Don't judge people only by what you see. You know, don't put them on the scale without knowing the reality. Don't be judgmental. You're not allowed to say such thing. You're not allowed to assume. And then he gave three scenarios. Listen to these three scenarios. He gave these three scenarios. He said that if this person wakes up early in the morning, goes to work so that he can take care of himself. He can be self-sufficient. He doesn't live with his parents. He doesn't rely upon his parents. It's not like his parents raised him up and then paid for his education. And then he never completed that education because he needed a year off so that he could think through things. You know, he needed a break because he's going through high school and the first two years of university and he needed a break. Oh my God. No, we, we are such kind of generation. Cheeseburger, that's what we call. He wakes up early in the morning, does his job. Why? Because he wants to take care of himself. He wants to be self-sufficient. Prophet said he is in fact in the path of Allah. He's better than a mujahid who is fighting in the path of Allah, who is fighting on a better feet. And then Prophet gave a second scenario. He said, if he wakes up early in the morning, goes to his work, and his intention is he can take care of his parents. He has mother, he has father, they are weak, he wants to take care of them. Or he has children, Zurriya, he has offsprings, and they are weak. So he's struggling and he's going and he's waking up in the morning and he's working so that he can take care of his children. Prophet said, indeed, he is in the part of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Third scenario. Now you will see the difference. Same situation, same exact thing, but you will see the difference. Prophet said he woke up early in the morning, goes for his work, but his intention is not to take care of himself or his family or his parents. He's going out so that he can tell other people how much he has. So that he, he, people can look at him and say, wow, he has such a nice motor car. He has such a nice house, he has such a nice front yard, backyard, flowers. You know, he has such a nice things. If that's his intention, then Prophet said, فَهُوَ فِي سَبِيلِ shaitan. Then he is in the path of shaitan. He is in the path of devil. What I'm trying to get at, the point that I'm trying to make is that Islam never approves of young people just sitting in the masjid or sitting in the basement of their houses, playing video games all time long, all day long, and not thinking about their responsibility. And thinking that Allah will provide for them. Allah will give them risk. And Allah will provide for them. <coughs> Islam says no. You can't just sit in the masjid. Not having any kind of responsibility. Not having any kind of job. Neglecting your responsibility. Neglecting your need. The need of your family. The need of your community. And just act, act righteous in the masjid. And do zikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Islam never <coughs> proves that. I'm not saying this. Let me give you another story of Umar radiallahu ta'ala. In the most difficult year of his time, Umar who became a Khalifa, most year, difficult year of his time, he came into the masjid. Difficult means economically, difficult year. <coughs> came into the masjid, saw some young people sitting in the masjid. He came into the masjid, he saw some young people sitting in the masjid. He said to them, what are you doing? And they said, we are asking, Nas'alullah, we are asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us risk. The time is very tough, the time is very difficult. People are, going through financial, uh, people are going through financial problems, financial difficulties. So we are asking Allah to provide for us. Umar ta'ala anhu said to them, stay here and I will be back. Stay here. Now the young people, they are thinking, MashaAllah, Umar ta'ala anhu will go to Baytul Mal and he will sacrifice some animals from the Sadaqah. He will make food for us. He will ask his servants to make bread, some rice, and then he will come back and he will serve us. He's the Khalifa, Amir al-Mu'mineen. But in fact, Umar anhu forgot his durra, his stick at home. <laughs> he said to them, stay here and I will be back. Went back home, got his stick, came back, locked the door of the masjid, start lashing them with the stick. And he said to them, you're sitting in the house of Allah and saying to Allah, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, and you know that that sky will never rain gold and silver. And you know that. You are saying to Allah, Yala, give us risk, give us risk, and you know the sky will never rain gold and silver. Get out. Find a job for yourself. Be independent. Be active. Do you all know the story of that person who came, Sunan Abi Dawud again, who came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, asking for some charity, for some sadqa, and Prophet asked him, do you have anything at home? Do you remember that story? Do you have anything at home? And he said, I have a sheet. I put some of it on the floor and put some of it, uh, and, 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 the, and use the rest of it to cover myself. And I have a 
container from which I drink water. The Prophet said, bring them to me. And the Prophet raised them in Masjid Nabi and said, who is going to buy it? A Sahabi said, I would buy it for one dirham. And he said, no, that's not enough. So he said it again, who is going to buy it? Third time, a Sahabi stood up and said, I'm going to buy it for two dirham. And Prophet said, this is yours. He gave one dirham to him and said, go and feed your family. And then another dirham he gave it to him. He said, go to the marketplace and bought an axe, buy an axe. Bring it to me and I would put the, what do you call it, wooden handle in it. And Prophet ﷺ gave it to him and he said, don't show me your face for 15 days. Don't come back to me for 15 days. After 15 days when he came back, he had 10 dirhams, nice clothes, food at home. Prophet asked him, what is more better for you? Ask him from people or be independent. What is better for you? Don't you think that Prophet has more tawakkal ala Allah than we all have combined? Then why is he teaching him this lesson? Even when you come for Jummah Salah, Muslim, by the way, don't have a day off. We don't. Christians and Jews have. Saturday, Sunday, their days are off. We don't. On Friday, Allah tells us to run for the remembrance of Allah. Go for the remembrance of Allah. But once you finish your prayer, فَإِذَا قُزِيَةِ الصَّلَاةِ Then what? فَانْتَشِرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ Spread out in the world. Do something. Be active. Our religion is a religion of action. It's a religion of activity. When you get into a trouble, you do something to figure out how to get out of that situation. That's exactly what the people of the cave did. They went into a cave. When you do something, then don't neglect Allah. When you find a solution, don't neglect Allah. Don't forget about Allah. In no way I'm not telling you that don't make dua to Allah. When you found a solution, make dua to Allah. That Allah put barakah in it. Because it's the most strongest weapon we have. The dua is the most strongest weapon we have. Make dua to Allah, but do something first. That's what the people of the cave did. As soon as they enter a cave, they found a cave, they enter a cave, and then they make dua to Allah. Rabbana, atina min ladunka rahmah. Oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants his mercy that, is, that comes directly from you and make our affairs straight because our affairs are broken, make them straight and in good order. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us this.